What is up everybody? On today's hot seat, we've got Jeremy, my Finnish carpenter. Um, he's gonna go over everything Finnish carpentry today. So we're gonna talk a little bit about if you're a homeowner looking to hire a Finnish carpenter, if you're a young person looking to become a Finnish carpenter, how much money you can make as a carpenter. We're gonna talk about the riskiest jobs he's taken on. And finally, we're gonna close it out with talking a little bit about um, his favorite tool set, whether it's Milwaukee, Makita, or DeWalt. So thanks for tuning in and here's Jeremy. Financially, the riskiest job I've ever taken on uh, was a restaurant in downtown Hudson. Uh, won't give you the name of the restaurant, but it was about a four month project. Um, it was myself and four other carpenters I had working on there. And uh, we weren't quite sure if we were gonna get paid on that job, but we kept through and saw it to the end. And it actually turned out to be a really nice restaurant. On the line in that one, uh, was probably about 40 grand. A lot, well, a lot of what keeps me motivated is the creative part of it. And we were able to do that in that restaurant. The whole restaurant was cherry finished and it's a very nice project to do. And then a lot of times though, when you're feeling that risk, you have to keep showing up because if you don't complete the job, then you give them an excuse not to pay you. Check it out. Probably I, I, I would have like to have known that the creative end of the, of the business has, w would have tapered off because um, that's really what I like to do. I like to build custom things and do cool things. Um, and there's really not a lot of that left anymore. Um, a lot of it is just speed and production at this point. And, and, but there is opportunities to do that stuff, but I think that's the biggest disappointment in the, in the long run is in the beginning there was a lot of custom and intricate things that, that I was able to build on the job site and a lot of that has gone away at this point. I think a lot of it is cost, um, mostly. You know, I mean, obviously people are still building big custom houses, but a lot of the stuff we're seeing in those houses is, is just get down to the basics. Um, we don't see a lot of the big custom bars anymore or, or the theaters inside the houses anymore. Uh, a lot of that stuff is gone and we're just down to basic cabinetry and, and doors and, and casing. Check it out. You want to know their job history and you want to see things because it, in our industry, we're not licensed or regulated. So it's important to have insurance and to have references. So I would think, and even if there's examples of the work, because there's a lot of guys that claim to be finished carpenters and there's different levels of finished carpentry. So especially if you're looking for that high quality, good looking finish that has a good design to it, you're going to want to see what they've done. Check it out. I would say uh, find a trade school and start there because um, there are carpentry programs in trade schools, not necessarily finished carpentry, but it's good to learn the basics. Because if you're a finished carpenter, you have to know the entire structure from the ground up. So I would start there. And then, you know, if you find an interest in other trades, you know, that's a good option too, because I feel personally that there's more job security in those types of trades, the plumbing, electrical, HVAC trades versus becoming a finished carpenter. So the advice I would give to somebody who's an hourly worker looking to make the jump to be out on their own, um, you have to have an established base of contacts because the finished carpentry trade is not really not going door to door to homeowners. You're working as a subcontractor for builders. So if you've been working for somebody, which is how I made the leap, I was an hourly employee for a finished carpenter for several years and then that person retired and I kept working for that same builder and I stepped into that role. But you really have to be able to sell yourself and sell your work because you're basically soliciting, you're going around finding builders, walking onto job sites, talking to builders and selling your skill set. So you have to have that confidence where you wouldn't necessarily have it if you were an hourly employee. Check it out. 
You know, I think year one, you're probably looking at thirty-five, forty thousand dollars. Um, year five, fifty to seventy thousand. Ten years in, hopefully, you've got a bunch of guys working underneath you, and you're hundred thousand plus. Um, but you've got to be good, skilled, and and willing to manage crews. Check it out. Knowing what I know now, if I could start over, I would probably choose the electrical trades if I was going to be in the trades. Um, I find that interesting, the engineering part of it especially. Um, but I also think that there's a lot more job security in the electrical trades because when building slows down, you still have the opportunity to, there's still going to be a demand for your services, whether it be a broken light fixture or, what, or whatever it might be. Check it out. <laughs> Milwaukee, Makita, or DeWalt? Uh, for me, it's Milwaukee, hands down. Hey! Um, my second choice would be DeWalt, but I wouldn't do DeWalt corded, cordless tools. I like their cordless tools, but I mean, their corded tools, but Milwaukee, for sure, wow. is hands down. Uh, for me, it's the most durable, best power, most reliability, most accurate. Milwaukee, if you have any regard for trim carpentry trades, you will make us a cordless track saw, please. Mm -hmm.